Uh, we started off at 8.30 with the Rules Committee meeting, and I have joining me today James Barber, who's a fellow member of the DPO Rules Committee. Um, the Rules Committee meetings are always the hottest ticket of the weekend. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much attention we get. Uh, we always have a professional parliamentarian, um, and usually the DPO executive director attends, and we get members of the DPO committee. This time we had uh, Valdez Bravo, vice chair, and uh, Travis Nelson, who's one of the DNC members attending. He's also an alternate delegate to the committee. Um, and everyone shows up. So 18 of the 19 delegates were in attendance, uh, plus most of the alternate delegates, and then various other observers. The room was packed. Um, so the business of the committee that day was approving gender-related changes to the bylaws. Um, uh, we approved a, cock, a template for caucus bylaws. Uh, we have caucuses that get formed and they, they have to, to uh, submit a, a, a set of bylaws, uh, but this is not a skill set that most people have. And so what we're, we're doing is providing them with a template so they can get most of the things accurate and then change you know, you know, anything that's specific to what they're trying to do. Uh, we adopted Standing Rule 13 on undocumented processes from the subcommittee uh, that was chaired by the Rules uh, Committee Vice Chair Rochelle Dixon uh, with a recommendation to approve. Uh, this was something that we had been working on for 18 months, and we're going to be talking about that in depth in the coming, coming uh, slides. And then there was a motion to table uh, establishing rules for the Grassroots Leadership Institute. Uh, this was something that I felt was important and we're going to also talk about a little bit later. Um, and it gives you some insight into how much uh, of a governing body the State Central Committee actually is. Um, uh, the next slide uh, talks about what it is and the Grassroots Leadership Institute was something that showed up on the DPO website uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, no one had ever heard about this talked about uh, and so where everyone was, not everyone, but a number of people were wondering what it was. On Saturday night at the gala, they collected somewhere around $60,000 to fund it. Um, and, uh, and so there was some concern about an institute because uh, we've had experience with Emerge, which is the training, uh, training program for females to run for office. Uh, we, we've had DPO officers sit on their interview uh, committees and actually eliminate candidates because who they supported in the primary in 2016. And we didn't want that kind of thing happening again. And so that's why uh, a motion was made to, to uh, write rules for this. Uh, we were told that uh, this isn't really an institute, it's an umbrella term for existing programs. So it's apparently nothing new, but just a way to raise more money for the existing budget. Um, uh, although there were different different things talked about, there, some, some comments were made about, well, the Institute really be, needs to be left to um, Jefferson Smith and Joe Smith to define, uh, which doesn't make any sense because they're really not part of the Democratic Party of Oregon structure and you don't have people coming in from the outside just by donating a bunch of money, uh, establishing programs within the party without it first being at least run through the, uh, the central committee or uh, in, in terms of an interim business, the executive committee. Uh, so those were tabled, um, possibly to come up again later. Um, so the next slide talks about how major programs are usually created. So uh, organizations usually have annual planning sessions and they identify a problem and then they figure out what a solution would be to address the problem and a budget is created which yields what your fundraising goal is and then the program is approved by somebody uh, and then the operating rules are written and then that's when fundraising commences but uh, the DPO sort of inverted this whole thing and they're raising money for something that, that has yet to be defined. A uh, little, little shocking, uh, I come from managing nonprofits and I've never seen anything like this done on a scale uh, before. Uh, but this is a message to all of you members of the state central committee. You are the governing body and this is going on and uh, you are ultimately responsible for this. James, did you have anything to add about the, the rules committee meeting? <clears throat> Not about uh, that. 
stuff in particular. I, I, I had missed that showing up on the uh, DPO website and I had no idea what that even was about because I missed the holiday party the night before where they talked about that. So, uh, but the rules committee, always fun. <laughs> so then in the afternoon at one fifteen, we started uh, with the state central committee itself. Uh, the, this is the governing body of the democratic party of Oregon. Um, uh, there's a, um, uh, a slide showing what the, what the meeting looks like. It's uh, this is probably the most unappealing uh, slide you can imagine for to get someone to attend a meeting. Um, then the center is uh, Valdez Bravo, the vice chair speaking, um, and then we have all of the officers of the party sitting in the front of the room. I was sitting towards the front, so you don't see the approximately 120 people that were sitting sitting behind me. Um, the the uh, um, The event itself, uh, um, the, you know, there's always a bunch of reports at the beginning. Um, uh, the um, the one of the first ones is the uh, uh, credentials committee. Uh, we had 98 of 135 state central committee delegates. Uh, who come from counties in attendance. And uh, so this was 72% of them. Unfortunately, what was predominantly represented was the west side of the state because this was a meeting held at the beginning of December. And so a lot of the counties that have two and three delegates to the state central committee were not able to make it. So uh, the, the, uh, the attendees disproportionately represented the west side of the state. and. Uh, again, it, it was unfortunate because it's really the east side of the state where we need to increase our support. Um, all of the officers were there. All of uh, all the CD chairs were there, and most of the caucus chairs. Um, there was one unfortunate incident in that a veteran was denied uh, uh, delegate status, uh, even though he was the first uh, delegate in line, alternate delegate in line from Washington County. Uh, that's something we have to work on. But the good news is uh, one of the things we'd worked on this time was making sure that everyone could attend even if they showed up late. And so the credentialing chair was, or the credentialing table was open the entire time. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, the, uh, the three pieces of business were the, uh, the gender equity uh, rules that we passed, and then standing rule 11, which was on rules for electronic meetings, and then standing rule 13, which was about uh, the undocumented processes. The uh, standing rule 11 uh, was really important because we currently don't have any rules governing electronic meetings and there's not a lot in the bylaws that uh, that speak to it. Um, and though we've had big issues in the past with uh, everyone being put on mute, which of course is strictly forbidden under uh, parliamentary procedure. Um, and so what we had been developing is a set of rules so that people's rights in, in participating in these meetings were, were protected. Uh, there were two, uh, two people that testified against them. The first one was uh, someone who um, uh, was a, a chair, and she, was, uh, she, was, uh, she felt that these rules were too cumbersome for her to, to administer because she likes putting everyone on, on mute. Um, but um, like I said, she can't do that anyway if she's following proper pro parliamentary procedure. Uh, the other comment was... Um, uh, was uh, interesting because they were complaining about us not uh, accommodating uh, hearing impaired participants, um, but we were in a meeting where even if if someone was hearing impaired at the state central committee, there was no ASL sign language people translating or anything, so they, they couldn't even participate in the meeting we were sitting in. Uh, so yes, we hadn't provided for ASL, and so, um, then we had a DNC member jump up and say, you have to listen to this person and his concerns uh, and, and turned it into an emotional argument. 
Uh, and then the, there was an immediate motion made to refer it back to the committee. And so that's what happened to standing rule 11. Um, next slide. So if you are in uh, uh, a committee meeting in the next couple of months, uh, because this will not come up again uh, at the earliest until for six months, uh, we are having another show today at 1230, and we're going to be talking about what you can do to protect your rights inside of an electronic meeting uh, if you find yourself in one, uh, and some examples of motions you can make on how to, to get your rights back. Um, and then we went to Standing Rule 13. Can I, can I add something there? Yeah. Uh, it was, that was really disappointing to see that rule get sent back to committee because we had worked on that a long time. How long did we work on that? A year and a half? Yeah, that was also in the hopper for a year and a half. I mean, it, it came about uh, because of the electronic meeting that was held two years ago at the State Central Committee, where people were muted by the host of the meeting, right? And they were unable to speak. They, they couldn't interject. They couldn't object. Uh, None of, none of the rules of Robert's orders were followed. Credentialing wasn't followed. Um, and that was when these electronic meeting rules proposal came about, was after that and in, and in response to that. So we, are, we find ourselves in another position like this. If there's an ice storm before the next SCC meeting, like last time, uh, we could end up operating with no electronic meeting rules again. So uh, the objections that were, that were put up um, they're not they're not addressed right people that have disabilities can't attend anyways people that have that live in rural areas and the internet's not good enough for them to attend electronic meetings those are still going to be a problem um, and it was twisted around as if these rules can somehow address that which they can't they, they weren't intended to uh, implement any new software or requirements it was just to empower the people that attend the meetings that we already are having. And uh, so big disappointment. Hopefully we'll get those passed. Uh, whatever. I mean, if we need to make some changes, great. But I don't think that going back to committee, we're going to be able to address any of those changes that they made because these rules weren't intended to address those changes. Um, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, Bram Sly one asks, so what is needed to be done to resolve this? <laughs> well, I, uh, I'll, I'll say in my opinion, I think that people need to realize that we are already operating. We're having electronic meetings and they're, they're operating without any rules right now. So we need to realize that there should be some rules in place to protect the members' rights of the people who should be at those meetings. So whatever, and, whatever we need to do to, to empower the members of those committees. And uh, somehow we need to get leadership behind this or elect leadership that, that is supportive of the work of the committees. Uh, I don't know about you, James, but I really didn't feel supported in this at all. Uh, and, and, and when we go through the review of the accomplishments of the last two years, you'll see that uh, uh, not, not a lot really got done. Um, how, how, how are you going to address the disability rights issue? I think that is a, a critical issue that um, may even be a legal issue for the party not to address. It was a very good point. Uh, and we should start by getting translators at the, uh, uh, at the state central committee meeting. You know, there's a cost involved, but it's really not that much. And uh, what was really interesting this past year was when a, a, a deaf candidate ran for Portland City Council. He showed up with a ASL translator and suddenly a whole group of, of hearing impaired uh, uh, residents of Portland started attending the, the campaign meetings. And so it would be really great if that would happen. Um, and then the, this, if the disability caucus would also reach out and 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 communicate to people that they're actually welcome and, and that ASL services will be provided. Then, you know, if we have, uh, if we use a tool like Zoom, uh, then people can actually visually see an ASL translator uh, uh, translating what was being said. So that would be a good, uh, one way to solve that problem. I, I, thank you. I was just about, I just want to jump in and say, one great way to fix the problem is to utilize the technology that they agreed to utilize in the platform under engage, I mean, like, 
the technology implementing these rules will help solve the problem it's kind of a you know loop there and it, it, it's just a greater problem with the SEC, please, you, two of you tell me if this is right as we go into standing rule 13. Do they not understand that when something is sent to committee, there's a, it's supposed to come back having with the understanding that it was debated, that you guys worked out a lot of this stuff. And it seems like when the SEC gets like, what a surprise, like the committee's deliberation doesn't seem to matter. Right? It's just that seems to be an overall attitude there. I, I don't know. That's just my, my view. You guys? I think we tend to see uh, some emotional arguments that uh, are designed to pull particular strings and get people to vote certain ways. Um, It's not just the Republicans that operate with uh, fear-based tactics. I think it happens uh, in the Democratic Party as well. And, you know, anytime there's contention, people tend to um, sit out or, or not make proposed changes because of fear that somehow the proposed change may be instituted forever and it will and it will never be able to be fixed <laughs> I, I think that's kind of the uh, reason why we saw this and the and the next one the next proposal lose is because the arguments seem to think that if we implement this there's we're stuck with it forever and uh, we're not we're not going to be able to fix it if problems actually arise So the next slide is on standing rule 13. Um, and so what we'll do is give an overview of what happened and then talk about the specifics because it should be, uh, uh, for some of you, it would be interesting to know how this actually took 18 months to to, to gestate. So uh, after 18 months of work on standing rule 13, which was a way to bring undocumented processes before the assembly so they can actually weigh in on them. And this is empowering the assembly to do what they are chartered to do in the bylaws, which is be the governing body of the state central committee. Um, we completed our work on October 7th, and then uh, no one uh, in the rules leadership uh, acted uh, and called the meeting to do anything on it. And so the November 11th deadline was missed for submitting things to the state central committee. And what that resulted in was, uh, first of all, no distribution of material on a very complex issue. Um, it required a two thirds vote to suspend the rules to even talk about this in the meeting itself, uh, which caused a lot of frustration within the central committee because there was a lack of forewarning and, and, uh, and they were sort of broadside with that. Uh, and ultimately what happened was that the state central committee referred this back to the rules committee um, for a number of reasons. And so, uh, 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 John, can we display the detailed version of the timeline and we can talk about how this started out and ended up where it was. What John has done is he's plotted out the um, the events of this in a timeline, so um, uh, we can walk through the events. So starting out um, in the June 25th State Central Committee meeting, there was a motion made that all undocumented processes be voided and that uh, uh, any new processes would be doc- would be documented and reviewed by the state central committee. That was then referred to the rules committee for refinement and review. Um, in the July, so then there were a se- series of meetings where we um, uh, considered stuff, but this one was not ever brought uh, brought forth. Uh, we kept having to drag this back and putting it in front of the committee. Um, John, if we could just focus on the the, uh, the Larry, slides. Larry, I dropped the link to this because it's a pub. Everybody, the link to this slide deck is in the description, and you should pull it up in a screen, Larry, because you're not going to be able to read this from my image here. There's no way. There's a lot of tiny text in here, and you know, I see you squinting to try to read it from my display. So I pulled the link up from, from Slack, and I'll show it. So on on July 18th, uh, there was a rules committee meeting, but there was no auction on undocumented processes. Um, On July 25th, there was another meeting. Um, uh, We discussed uh, SEC terms, uh, uh, delegates terms. Uh, There was no action on the undocumented processes. On August 6th, there was another um, 
uh, rules committee meeting. This was at the uh, the Q3 uh, uh, meeting where everyone got together. Uh, we discussed undocumented processes. Um, uh, and then on September 17th, we had another meeting and that's where we actually discussed the electronic meeting rules uh, and we discussed the undocumented processes. Um, and it was decided that Chris and James would create a survey to understand what the document, undocumented processes were that were out there. Uh, and so that was kicked off on September 17th and was left open until uh, just a few weeks ago. And during that entire time, uh, four undocumented processes had been collected. And so the argument that the admin committee would be overwhelmed with work was uh, ended up not being valid because only four had been brought up. And the real intention of this was only to focus on the uh, processes that embarrassed the Democratic Party of Oregon because they 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 uh, they go against our, our sensibilities in terms of fairness and equality. On October 1st, there was a special meeting where we talked about the electronic rules. Um, um, voted on a bunch of other stuff. Um, uh, including bylaws for uh, some committees. Um, then on October 11th in 2017, we talked about undocumented processes. Um, and we had a, the first draft of the actual rules that was submitted by somebody. So Jeremy Likens actually took the initiative to translate all of the talk into something. Um, and then we had the November 8th special meeting. Uh, nothing happened there. Um, we had the November 19th meeting in Portland. Um, we talked about replacement provisions for delegates. Um, Keep in mind, uh, everybody, that's 2017. We just cleared. All right. <laughs> yes. And then we get into 2018. Uh, we had another special meeting on January 16th. Um, we talked about the platform convention because we actually did have some, some major things coming up. Uh, so we talked about the platform convention, the, uh, which was coming up in March. Um, at the February 7th meeting, we passed the platform convention rules. Um, uh, March 17th was the actual weekend of the platform convention, and there was a state central committee meeting, but it was an abbreviated one, so there was no work done there. Um, on the June 10th meeting, we, had, uh, we approved the Young Democrats bylaws and the Native American caucus bylaws. Uh, nothing on rules 11 and 13. Um, and then we had the the former chair, uh, Eliza Dozono, resign, and Chris was promoted. And that happened and it was announced on July 25th. Um, on, then at the beginning of July, I had sent two messages to the chair, the new chair of the rules committee requesting an electronic meeting because we were getting to the point where we're running out of time to deal with these. I received no response from him. And so I then contacted the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon. And I said, hey, is Chris on vacation or something? Because uh, I requested a meeting and I didn't receive any response. Uh, I'm a delegate and, you know, a common courtesy to delegates would be at least to acknowledge that you got a message. Uh, but that didn't happen. Um, after I contacted Gene, then we got a response from Chris that he had received the messages, but still no meeting was scheduled. <coughs> so what the, there was a majority in the rules committee that wanted to proceed. And so we scheduled our own meeting. We had uh, six members who wanted to meet. And so uh, we conducted that meeting at the end of July. Um, where we then considered the rules and uh, the electronic meeting rules and got those passed. Uh, we caused great consternation. We were told that um, uh, we couldn't do that. And this is part of the whole control issue within the Democratic Party of Oregon that only a chair can call a meeting. And if a chair doesn't call a meeting, then you can't meet, which uh, I got testimony from two professional parliamentarians, which refuted, refuted that. Um, if you have a chair that doesn't call meetings, any two members can call a meeting and uh, make progress. Um, then uh, we finally get to um, uh, August 6th, where we discussed uh, 
this was the beginning of the whole non-binary gender equality discussion, which uh, then took precedence over everything else that we were discussing. Um, so, so was that just to clarify, because so the Chris Wig, the chair of the rules committee, called for a meeting finally on for, for a meeting to happen on August 6th. And the meeting that you had on August 6th after you guys had requested one and, and been denied your own meeting didn't discuss the issues you wanted to discuss. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yes, thank you for clarifying. Okay, thank you. Yes, because for some um, for some reason the the gender issues were hot, and so you know the being nice people, we were accommodating to the request of the chair, and we uh, deferred to him and and uh, continued on. Um, with the Chris then sent the proposed uh, rules that Jeremy had written on, to the... Hang on, I just want to read something here. In your notes, it says, on August 6th, the out, accepted outcome of July 30th, 2018 meeting. So was the July 30th meeting the meeting that the six of you had? Because it seems like what happened is you guys made some stuff on the, on the 30th, and then on this meeting on August 6th, the Rules Committee approved that stuff. Is that, is that what I'm reading? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't six. It was a majority of the rules committee. So there were 10 people in attendance. And we, uh, because we didn't have the regular chair, we appointed a pro tem chair and a pro tem secretary and took minutes. And then uh, we presented those minutes at the next meeting and they were accepted. So okay. even though they claimed that we couldn't call a meeting, they tacitly accepted the results of the meeting. Okay. And that's how we were able to make progress. So your illegitimate meeting resulted in legitimate rules being passed by the membership and this is after the chair of the rules committee refused to call a meeting thank you yes. i just want to clarify <laughs> so then the the output of that was sent to the admin committee by the chair of the rules committee for feedback and that's where we get this uh this four page response from the ad commit admin committee with all their concerns about what had been written inside the rules um and so what we decided on September 16th was to create a subcommittee to take the feedback from the admin committee and incorporate that into the rules, uh, which is what we did with uh, Vice Chair Rochelle Dixon. Um, so we met and we, we, uh, we simplified the language, um, which ended up causing a problem when we presented this to the state central committee because suddenly the language was uh, at such a high level that no one could understand what being said. Um, but then that was delivered on October 7th, and that's when uh, there was no more meetings called. Um, and we missed the November 11th deadline to have these rules uh, on the agenda of the fourth quarter State Central Committee meeting, which is why we then had to uh, uh, have the State Central Committee vote to suspend the rules to even talk about these. So wait, so, so no meeting was called because there, there was time. There wasn't a reason. It wasn't like the end of sessions. It's just the chair of the rules committee refused, didn't call a meeting in that time period. Right. Okay. Just clarifying. So the deadline was November 11th. We missed the deadline, and then we ended up at the state central committee meeting. And then, uh, you know, we get into the meeting, and the first thing that happens before it starts is that uh, two people start passing out. Um, uh, this four-page document, which was a reprint of the feedback from the admin committee on the previous version of the rules. So they weren't even relevant to the rules that we were discussing that day. And uh, it was printed on the same paper as other documents from the Democratic Party of Oregon. And so it was very confusing to people. They looked at them and said, well, this must be today's issue and and they're reading through them and they see all of these problems that were highlighted and it's like oh well, these must be really really bad uh so uh that was going on it had been pointed out to the chair by two different people that her name was at the bottom of the memo um which showed um uh, it at least implied bias and uh, if anyone knows what a chair is actually supposed to do they're supposed to be unbiased and so by issuing a memo from the admin committee it pretty much eliminates any of them from running that portion of the meeting all right let's clarify there because i want to make sure james concurs on this because we're not certain this is from the admin committee right it's on admin paper but it was printed by lane county democratic party correct uh we don't know who printed it 
necessarily. Uh, it was printed on the same color paper that one of the other rules that we were going to consider was printed on. So it could have been printed at the same time on the same paper that uh, the other thing that came out of the rules committee would have been printed on. So has anybody claimed responsibility for printing it out? The DPO or the Lane County is like, is this going to be an anonymous printing? Did a terrorist group print this out? <laughs> Well, we, we know that uh, I, I, James verified this, but I, it was someone from Lane County who was passing it out. And then there was a DPO staffer that was also passing it out. There were not many people sitting in that area because the meeting hadn't convened, but uh, she handed it to me. So I know that that happened. So this was handed out by a DPO staffer. Um, so it's, kind of, it's really hard to deny that this uh, any association between the admin committee and, and what was going on that day. Yeah, so keep in mind, I saw it handed out by the a DPLC person. That's the Democratic Party of Lane County, who Chris Wig is the chair of the Democratic Party of Lane County, and he's the chair of the Rules Committee. So there were there's a lot of, there's a lot of conflicts in, and, in those acts. And didn't Chris I, I didn't Chris Wig just win a, a re-election or election somewhere? And uh, I heard he it, he just just the, last night. Right. And Lane yeah, County? there was the reorganization yesterday. The Lane County did their reorganization. Yesterday. Right. One re-election to chair because nobody was running against him. OK. Glad he's still in power. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the so then we debated it and uh, people raised issues about uh, uh, receiving all of this information late, which uh, was pretty much beyond our control. And uh, the what ultimately happened was that the. Uh, it was referred back to the rules committee to enhance the language. And so now it's been kicked back, um, still alive, but kicked back to the rules committee. But ultimately, I mean, what is so disappointing about this is that we really didn't feel like we were getting supported by the rules chair or the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon or the admin committee, even though a majority on the rules committee was, was working on this stuff. So, uh, you know, where is democracy in all of this? It would be really great if we had leadership that supported its people. Yeah, I might add that there was there was continuous effort to make the focus on the four unwritten policies that were submitted and trying to spend our rules committee meeting time to address those four policies rather than a policy that just stopped unwritten policy unwritten policies from being used. And being able to address those, so it was it was a distraction uh, to try and get us to focus on that and and keep this from being introduced to the state central committee. That's that's just one of the it's one of the things that uh, someone who doesn't want something to pass would try to do. You, the the tactic is to delay. You delay as long as you can. Uh, in this case. Uh, Chris Wig was against this. He was able to delay it until our term ran up. Uh, the SEC delegates serve a two-year term. That ended at this last meeting. So now it's going to have to be considered by a whole new body of SEC delegates than the ones who sent it back to committee to begin with a year and a half ago. So this whole cycle could start again when they go, well, we're really not informed on this matter. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you have to have leadership that wants reform, and that was not what the current chair was elected to do. Uh, uh, and so we continue to live with these policies within, within the Democratic Party of Oregon, which, which some of us find to be an embarrassment. Um, but we will continue the fight on. Um, I, just, I, I just want to urge the uh, future SCC delegates to consider the tactics of the arguments that come before them. Uh, the Rules Committee, uh, all of the committees actually do a lot of work behind the scenes. It's really difficult if you have even a Rules Committee member who hasn't attended those meetings to come in at the end and, and kind of blow up all the work that was done on those committees because they weren't there to hear the arguments on why a specific language was chosen, why we went a certain route. <coughs> you might have... Uh, liken it to uh, building a car engine, you know? Uh, 
at the end, the driver doesn't need to know how the engine functions, how it actually operates, or, or why each piston size was chosen for whatever reason. Uh, they just want to know if it's going to work. The rules committee is in charge with building this particular engine. It was sent back to the rules committee to do that. The rules committee sent forth recommendations, and then those were ignored by people who uh, didn't didn't understand it. And, and really, there's a lot of there's a lot of things in the bylaws that somebody just reading one section wouldn't understand it. There were people that were complaining because they didn't understand why it didn't further explain the process on what a policy needs to do. Well, that's in a different section. We're not going to relist every single section of the rules in the bylaws in different sections so that people don't have to refer to different sections. So when we make a change, and if it doesn't include particular language that's already taken care of in a different part of the bylaws, you can't just assume that it's not being addressed. So th there's a challenge. That's the challenge that the rules committee has. That's the challenge of the delay tactics. We don't get the opportunity to talk to the members about the issues that may come up that, that may already be addressed, their concerns that they might think of right off the bat when they, when they read it, and they may assume we didn't talk about that. Uh, so those delay tactics really hurt with us being able to make those explanations. So realize that that happens and that these rules are not permanent. When we pass something, uh, we can always go back and fix them. And we do that regularly. Wow. <laughs> Boom. Thank you. Betsy, you had some comments? Betsy, were there some comments from the line? Uh, yeah. Um, Charles wanted to know from James, how many vacant PCP positions are there in Lane County? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. I mean, we, we have quite a bit. We've, we've filled up uh, Lane County. The biggest seat is uh, Eugene. Eugene in Springfield has the most number of PCPs, and, and we have a lot of those uh, precincts filled. Uh, but overall, Lane County still has hundreds of seats available. Uh, another question was, Oz Lefebvre, um, Larry and James, how are you doing the same thing over and over again and going to get a different result? And I know that's, <laughs> a, you know, that's a little bit rhetorical, but I have another kind of related question. Why do you not just take the information directly to all the SEC delegates? Lack of time. Oh, oh what? my, can I answer Betsy, please? <laughs> what? That's what this show is for. <laughs> I mean, we've been trying to reach them. We've been trying to reach Oregon. I created a media network to inform the electorate of Oregon. And you know how many people watch from Oregon? Maybe 15. Maybe today's different because we got the interest of some other people in the DPO. But the, the progressives of Oregon, the Dem Democrats in Oregon, in my view, aren't interested in being informed by anybody other than the DPO chair. So, uh, you know, we've tried. That's the, the, we've tried. Yeah. So to the first part, maybe there will be different leadership next time that, is be, that will be more supportive of the work of the standing committees. Uh, that would be a huge change. Um, the other... Uh, what was my second thought? I forget my second thought. Um, what was the second part of the question, Betsy? Well, why, I think going to do what? What are you going to do? Mine was how not take it directly to the SEC members. Oh, um, it's it's actually very difficult to track down uh, who the state central committee members are. Um, uh, that w when you when you run for an office and you're given access to uh, the the master list of state central committee members, you have to sign this agreement that you'll never use it for anything else. For some reason, the Democratic Party of Oregon, and this is one of the unwritten policies, consider things like uh, the membership of the state central committee to be uh, uh, confidential information when in fact it should be public information. And that's another area that we need to address because uh, this is America and we have freedom of speech. And, and so we have to be able to engage with our fellow delegates and talk about this stuff. So that is a change that we need to make. And I would add lack of time. Um, a lot of people are busy. These are, we're all just volunteers here. People have their jobs, people run for office, people 
volunteer for office. You know, we had an election come up, a lot of attention, a lot of uh, efforts were spent with some uh, races and campaigns there. And it's really difficult when, when there's a body that meets once every few months, it's really difficult to get in contact with all those people individually to try and uh, get, get this stuff in front of them if the chairs are obstructive. Now, the chair of the Rules Committee could certainly have gotten this information out. He could have taken the uh, proposed uh, standing rule and sent it beyond just the admin committee for other feedback. Uh, he could have, We could have addressed that feedback as a committee. But in this case, Chris Wigg has made it clear from the beginning that he was against both of those uh, standing rules, 11 and 13, and he didn't do anything to help to help get those concerns addressed to help get them passed he didn't see a problem with how things are currently operated and so he wasn't interested in helping get the problems fixed even if a majority of the rules committee uh feel differently 